I am happy that we have Elisa Redmiles with us and the discussion is moderated by Jim. Uh, the topic is hot. It, the second wave is, is back as it's called the wave and the numbers are sharply rising. And somehow the topic is accompanying our digital humanism lecture since, since the beginning. And we have three events already focusing on that topic. Uh, on the organizational part, some notes. We usually have 30 minutes talk and this is followed by a discussion moderated by Jim. And at the end, we have again, Peter Knees with his piece of music and he has selected some nice piece of music for today. Um, I also ask you to, to mute your phone during the presentation and then for the discussion, raise your hand or uh, write your question into the chat. Uh, when you speak, please tell first your name so that we know who you are. Uh, I also want to point you at our website there you can have a look at our future events and also have a look at our previous past events. And you have a, loop, uh, a link to the YouTube Digital Humanism channel where all the presentations and talks since one and a half year, you can look at them and you can, you can view them. Uh, we have already, I think, 35 or 36 presentations and talks there. And it's already a, a rich body of, uh, of knowledge. And if you're interested, you can either sign the manifesto on the website and support the manifesto for digital humanism, or you can on the other side also subscribe to the newsletter in the case you only want to be informed about our lectures. The next one will be in two weeks on how AI is reshaping our world. And this discussion will be by three philosophers, one coming from the US, one from Europe, Europe and one from China. So I'm really looking forward to this event in two weeks. Today, I am happy to have here Jim Laris as a moderator. He will introduce afterwards the speaker of today. Thanks, Jim, for moderating. He is a professor and dean of the computer science department of EPFL in Switzerland. Before that, he was at Microsoft Research, where he was uh, acting as a researcher as well as a director. Um, and before that, he was at the University of Wisconsin. Um, Jim has written numerous papers and he also has 40 US patents in the field of computer science. He received the Young Investigator Award from the National Science Foundation in the US. And he's also an ACM fellow. Uh, he studied in Berkeley and he has also studied applied mathematics in Harvard. And specifically for the topic of today, Jim co-led the project for developing the Swiss Corona app and where they had the DP3T, decentralized privacy preserving uh, uh, architecture. And they also cooperated with Google and Apple who they agreed on this protocol. And this is the basic protocol that they used in most of the worldwide Corona apps, and I am happy that you are with us, Jim, and to moderate this session. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hannes. Um, it's a great pleasure today to introduce Eliza Redmiles. Um, she's a, currently a researcher at Microsoft Research, but very soon she's also going to hold a position at the Max Planck Institute, um, I think next month. And so we'll be able to welcome her to Europe as well. I just wanted to say a few words and try to connect uh, today's topic a little bit to the larger themes of digital humanism. And then I'll turn the floor over to Eliza. Um, you know, for those of us who have been involved in this, uh, it's been an interesting experience. You know, we built a digital app to solve a rather pressing emergency. And um, we went into it thinking that, of course, everybody's going to want to use this app because it seems fairly easy, fairly painless to use. And I think all of us were in pretty much every country um, were very surprised at the reaction that the app got. There was a great deal of skepticism, a great deal of suspicion, a great deal of reluctance to pick up the app. 
uh, you know, 20%, 30% adoption in a country is actually pretty good these days. And um, in spite of the fact that the app has demonstrable e efficacy um, with uh, real numbers and real uh, examples. And, um, you know, this was, I think, quite a bit of a surprise. And I think that the issues that Eliza is going to raise in her talk today go very much to this question of the relationship between people and digital technology. And so I think uh, that contact tracing is actually a very good lens, a, a very sort of immediate lens to see uh, some of the issues that we face in the future in terms of our relationship as not only people, but also as uh, governments, um, groups of people, establishments uh, to technology. So I won't say any more. I'll turn the floor over to Eliza. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, are you able to see my slides? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so today I would like to uh, talk about how we can try to learn from potential users uh, how they would like to be encouraged to adopt contact tracing apps. Um, and this work kind of fits in a broader framework um, where we know that in general, computational problems or building new technologies requires constant decision making. Um, so for example, b before coronavirus, right, there was a lot of debate about, you know, what features are fair to use when we're building new machine learning classifiers. Um, and then as COVID started and we started developing COVID-19 technologies, uh, questions got raised about what data was appropriate to use in those technologies, which features should we prioritize building? Um, and typically it's experts who sort of press, set best practices or make these decisions. Um, but uh, and when they do that, um, experts are sort of trading off costs and benefits, right? So there's this um, paper from a couple of years ago uh, in which the authors discussed um, how people make the trade-off of releasing data sets. Um, so they were working on uh, public health before COVID-19. And they said, well, you know, experts tend to make sort of normative decision where they trade off uh, the risk to people's privacy from releasing some particular public health data set against the benefit to public health. Um, and we know from the past uh, that experts don't always agree on best practices or on those trade-offs. Um, so early on in coronavirus, there was disagreement about uh, how best to tackle the disease. In AI, there's been disagreement. Um, in security, there's been disagreement. There's always sort of disagreement. Um, and maybe most importantly, uh, users and experts may disagree about what decisions should be made in the trade-offs um, that might determine either what data is released or what features are used in a classifier or what data is used in a COVID app. Um, and this is especially critical because when users um, disagree with sort of the decisions that have been made for them, uh, that may lead them to choose not to adopt um, particular technologies. Um, and well before uh, we even got into the land of uh, technology, this disagreement between experts sort of prescribing best practice and users' um, own behavior uh, is something that moral philosophers were talking about when they were thinking about how do we make rules for a society. And they described that there were sort of two ways to make rules, right? A normative way um, where experts are prescribing the best practices um, or a descriptive way where experts learn from non-expert preference and behavior and infer uh, best practice from that behavior. And in reality, we often wanna find ourselves somewhere in a balance here. We can't expect non-experts to know everything and to be, be able to learn everything from them. Um, but we also can't stay too trapped in sort of our own expert um, bubble because we may create something that other people are not willing to use. Um, and so in general, uh, a lot of my work um, and some other work in this area focuses on taking descriptive ethics approaches to developing technology. So trying to learn from people how we should handle their data, what um, functionality is ideal or acceptable um, and et cetera. So in today's talk, um, I'm gonna specifically talk about um, a large project uh, that I've been leading applying descriptive ethics um, to trying to increase adoption of COVID-19 apps. Um, and so in terms of COVID-19 apps, right, most of us um, probably know that the benefit of a contact tracing app 
um, in particular, scales um, nearly quadratically with the number of users. Um, and this chart on the right is from uh, the now kind of infamous Oxford article that came out uh, early in the pandemic, sort of showing how uh, levels of adoption of app, of a contact tracing app, would affect um, you know, the number of new cases. Uh, and so really in some adoption matters, we really wanna to try to get people to adopt um, these apps. And so early on when uh, technologists were starting to uh, talk about building these apps, um, experts, especially um, folks at EPFL as well as sort of across the world, um, were really focused on ensuring the apps protected user privacy. Uh, they saw a lot of risk for um, government surveillance and um, other privacy problems. And so that was a big focus. Um, and that was particularly critical. Um, but sort of after this push for privacy, there still remained the question, how do we get people to adopt, right? Because we, we know that people are willing to adopt things that aren't private and they typically aren't willing to adopt things just because they're private. They, um, none of us has sort of probably gone and installed an app just because it was private. Um, and so then we're sort of at this crossroads. How do we get um, people to adopt these apps? And so the, the goal of this talk is to see um, whether we can understand and learn from potential users and get them to tell us how to get them to adopt. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how we identify what the considerations are in people's adoption decisions, how we can use descriptive, descriptive approaches to predict people's adoption intent, um, and then how we can leverage these findings to actually try to drive change um, to app design and marketing that can improve adoption in the real world. Um, so to start, we wanted to identify what are people's considerations when they think about adopting. In order to do that, um, we used a series of carefully constructed online surveys. Um, and all of the work that I talk about today, uh, the results that I'm presenting are situated in the US. We have done some work um, in other countries, but what I'm presenting today just for simplicity is US oriented. Um, and so in these surveys, we asked um, different types of questions. So closed answer questions, which are ones with answer choices regarding people's willingness to install different kinds of apps um, and kind of what features would be a priority for them, as well as open answer questions where people sort of describe their reasoning um, for why they would or wouldn't install or why they're um, undecided. Um, and in these surveys, we're using um, what are called census representative surveys. So uh, there's an online panel um, and we sample from that panel in such a way that the people uh, who are gonna take our survey are gonna have demographics that match those of the US census on various demographic strata. Um, and the goal of this is to get as wide and representative um, a view of people's uh, sentiment as possible um, without going all the way to like a telephone survey or something you would use in a political poll. Um, and what we find from uh, these surveys, which I'll go into the results in a little bit more depth in a minute, what we find is that there are many possible inputs to people's COVID-19 adoption decisions. Um, so privacy is necessary, uh, but for many people, it's not sufficient. And I think technologists knew this, um, but we didn't quite know, you know where to go or what it was that people cared about. Um, and what we find is that people care about the benefits of the app. What is it giving to me? Um, the provider who is offering this app and do I trust them? Um, absolutely care about privacy. What data are you using? What are the risks of leakage? Um, mobile costs. So, uh, you know, is this going to eat up my battery life? Is this going to consume mobile data that at least in the US is quite expensive um, in monthly payments? Um, accuracy or efficacy. Is this thing going to work? Um, you know, similar questions were raised about uh, COVID vaccines and rapid tests. Uh, and finally, architecture of the app. Um, not that users, of course, express it in this way, but they're asking questions about how secure is this thing? Do I have control over deleting my data? So on and so forth. Things that sort of as technologists fit under um, app architecture. Okay, um, so touching on uh, a couple of these a little bit more deeply, um, we find that provider influences uh, people's reported willingness to install or their intent to install. Um, and what this chart shows is the proportion of uh, survey respondents who said that they would be willing to install a contact tracing app from a particular provider. 
Um, and the dark blue bar shows the people who were only willing to install from that one provider. Um, and there's two things you kind of see off the bat here, right? One is that at least Americans were most willing to install apps from health protection agencies, almost 40% of them. Um, but there's also kind of a wide uh, variation here, right? So we have um, some people who are only willing to install from their health insurers, some people who are only willing to install, install from a tech company, so on and so forth. Um, and so there's sort of not a universal preference. Um, and this has some interesting implications given the fact, of course, that um, most of the, the COVID-19 apps that are finally starting to come out in the US are um, based on the Apple Google protocol, which requires that they're partnered with a health protection agency. Um, so that covers a large portion um, of what we see in this chart here, but obviously not everything. And so there's um, some room to think about, you know, what do interoperable apps look like? What do health insurer provided apps look like, uh, et cetera. Um, and so we have a, a paper coming out soon and there's a, a short article in Scientific American that goes into this um, in more depth. Okay, um, next we kind of want to look at, you know, those who don't want to install, why don't they want to install? Um, what we see is that they don't want to install because they're concerned about um, privacy, uh, what, uh, mobile costs, or I just don't use apps, so I don't want to do this thing. Uh, they're concerned about accuracy, is it going to work? They're a little bit concerned about security. And then there's a big bar up here, right? Which is they're concerned about necessity. Um, and some of this may be kind of US specific. We've had a lot of politicization um, around COVID, but that has been true in um, some other places as well. Uh, and it's not just that I don't believe in COVID, but in some cases it's, I'm overwhelmed by COVID. I don't want to do one more thing. I already feel it closing in on me. Um, and so those people are um, kind of particularly difficult to get to adopt, right? Because for some of the other concerns, you may be able to address those with marketing messaging. You may be able to design an app um, that doesn't have mobile costs, or you may be able to um, you know, prove to someone that it's accurate. But if they just don't wanna hear it or they don't believe in it, that's sort of a larger problem. Okay, um, so next we can ask the question, you know, which of these considerations matters the most? So all of these came up um, in our surveys, but we'd like to know what are the highest priority because those are going to be the most important uh, for us to go and tackle. Um, and in order to answer this question, we're going to use um, what's called a conjoint analysis. Um, so the conjoint analyses are a traditional like quantitative marketing um, research technique where you ask people to make a number of choices uh, and based on those choices you infer you know how should I market a product or how should I um, what kind of product should I build so for example if I'm building a new TV I might use one of these analyses to figure out what colors of TV I should release and what um, dimensions of TV people prefer and so forth. Um, we're going to do the same type of thing, uh, except in this case, of course, we're considering COVID-19 apps instead of televisions. Um, and the goal of this analysis is twofold. So first, it's going to allow us to figure out when we vary each of these and we make people make uh, choices between the different um, apps with different attributes, we can figure out which of the attributes are most important. Um, and then we can also figure out within a particular attribute, uh, what is the strongest statement that we can make. So if we wanna go and market this, is it best to say, hey, the benefit of this app is that you can reduce the number of people infected in, with coronavirus? Or is it better to say, well, the benefit is that it can alert you to uh, if you've been exposed to someone with coronavirus. Those are both potential benefits of the app. Is there one of those that is most salient to people and that we would wanna use uh, when we try to get them to adopt? Okay. Um, so in our particular conjoint analyses, um, we were presenting people uh, with the scenario, imagine there's a mobile phone app intended to combat coronavirus in the US. Different apps have different benefits and risks and may collect different types of information about you. Please look carefully at the app uh, options below. Each column represents an app with different attributes that will be designed and distributed by a health protection agency. So in this case, um, because we had already done some analysis on providers, we took the most popular provider that was also most likely to be used, right, with GAN apps. 
um, assume both apps are equally popular, which one would you choose? And we had a number of uh, attention check questions and et cetera before this, but then people got to make a choice between two apps. So they could say, oh, I would choose this one, that one, or I wouldn't choose either of these. And we're testing um, those different attributes that I showed on the prior screen. Um, once again, we used a, a census representative sort of representative sample, um, like I had described before. Uh, and what we find is that accuracy and privacy are among the most important factors in at least Americans' intent to install COVID apps. Um, so if we look uh, here on the right, um, we have created sort of a composition of people's intent to install. 29% uh, of which depends on privacy and data use considerations. So experts were 100% correct to kind of go after those. 29% uh, depends on accuracy considerations. So uh, specifically the true positive rate. How many exposures is this app going to be able to detect? Uh, we also see that uh, mobile data use and um, app benefits are also important to people. Um, and this was sort of, uh, especially mobile data use and battery life was um, especially interesting to talk about since that hadn't really been a discussion um, as we were coming into things. Uh, and what we see, and I'll discuss this a little bit more in a minute, but what we see is that emphasis on mobile data use and battery life is correlated, um, especially with socioeconomic status. Um, and this is part of where descriptive approaches can really help us um, because often as technologists, perhaps for us, mobile data or battery life considerations aren't particularly critical. Um, but for certain populations, uh, they're going to be especially critical. And so descriptive uh, ethics approaches allow us to capture those other views that we might not um, automatically think about in our lives. Okay, um, and getting to this point, not everyone um, values these attributes equally. Um, and so these results are from uh, linear regression models where we take the importance of an attribute and then include um, a number of controls. And I'll cover a few of the sort of top line results here. Um, but in addition to the, the socioeconomic result that I mentioned, um, we also see that uh, Democrats, so left-leaning people in the US have a tendency to um, put more weight uh, in their decision on the accuracy of the app, while Republicans put more weight on the privacy. Um, younger adults tend to put more weight on what does the, the app offer me? What are the benefits as well as its accuracy while older adults put more weight on privacy and mobile costs. Um, those who are more engaged in consuming COVID-19 news um, tend to focus more on the benefits. Those who are less engaged focus more on privacy, um, perhaps because the news is helping address uh, some of the concerns people might kind of have by default. Um, and then those who are more knowledgeable about COVID-19 and by that, I mean, they understand um, more about the infection vector and how they're likely to get sick and how many people have been infected um, are more likely to focus on the accuracy of the app. Um, and so we now know sort of like, what is the space of things that people are considering when they're thinking about adopting these apps um, and you know, which, which features are most important to them, which is privacy and accuracy. Um, but we can obviously dig further, right? Which is, it's great that they're really interested in privacy and accuracy, but how good do these apps actually have to be um, for people to be willing to adopt them or for us to reach majority adoption? Um, and so in the next uh, little bit, I would like to talk about how we're going to use descriptive approaches to try to predict adoption intent um, to kind of figure out when is an app good enough. Okay. Um, so, like I said, um, privacy and data use considerations are the most important um, in uh, the numerous surveys that, that we ran. Um, and so how private does it have to be? How accurate? Um, and basically, we can decompose this question into like, does the amount of privacy and accuracy predict people's adoption intent? Um, in order to answer that question, we're going to do more surveys. Um, this time, we're going to survey uh, nearly 4,000 crowd workers. Um, we used crowd workers in this case because we needed um, such a large sample. We needed it rapidly, and we did a number of pretests um, to compare the responses of US crowd workers with 
um, the more demographically representative panels. And we saw um, no statistically significant differences on a number of tests. Um, so that's why we went ahead with crowd workers, although we've done some replication of this later um, on census representative participants. Um, and so we're going to try to predict um, people's reported intent to adopt apps um, given quantified um, privacy and or accuracy. Um, so specifically, we're going to address uh, false negatives. Um, so here we're going to at first implicitly assess people's perception of the privacy of these apps. So we want to understand, you know, before we tell them anything about accuracy, how likely do they think it is that data will be leaked from this app? Um, to do that, uh, we're going to ask them to pick the likelihood of data leakage um, on this type of numeric chart. Uh, so the question says studies show that best attempts to protect the data of those who use this, that despite best attempts to protect the data of those who use this app, some people may have information about who they have been near compromised and used for purposes other than the fight against coronavirus. Please indicate on the chart below how many app users you think will have this information compromised over the next year. Um, and this is a chart that has been used in a number of health risk studies where you get people to uh, try to indicate, say, the chance of, chance of cancer, um, a number of crime studies, and then in uh, security research that I've done as well. So people sort of pick uh, what they think the probability of um, people having their uh, data leaked is. Um, after we get their implicit privacy exception, uh, we ask their willingness to adopt given some concrete uh, false negative or true positive rate. Um, so we say, imagine that you're exposed to someone uh, who has coronavirus 100 times over the next year. If you do not use the app, one out of 100 times, public health workers will be able to detect and notify you that you were exposed. If you use the app, some true positive, which is some number that we use in the study, some true positive out of 100 times, the app will be able to detect and notify you that you were exposed. Would you install this app? Um, and so here, um, the reason we're using this X out of 100 um, is from a lot of research, again, on health literacy and numeracy, um, where they figured out that this is sort of the best way to express percentages um, to people. And what we're trying to understand is, as that true positive rate goes up, does willingness to adopt also increase? Um, and before doing this survey, we did a number of cognitive tests to make sure that people um, understood this question the way it was intended. Okay. Um, in a separate condition, so a different set of crowd workers, um, saw a similar uh, same implicit assessment of privacy perception plus a willingness to adopt um, given some false positive rate. Uh, so in this case, they were offered um, an app that if they used it would have a, a perfect um, sensitivity. It would detect every time they were exposed, but it would also incorrectly notify them an extra false positive number of times when they weren't actually exposed. Um, and so we wanted to see, you know, are they willing to install in that case? Uh, and then finally, uh, we tested the impact of actually explicitly telling people privacy risk um, by giving them an explicit statement of privacy risk. So saying, you know, studies show despite the best attempts, uh, some people have information compromised, some P out of a thousand people who use this app will have this information compromised. Um, and so in this case, what we're trying to see is if we actually set their privacy perception instead of at taking what they implicitly assume, how does that affect uh, adoption intent? Uh, and then we again ask the false negative rate question. Okay, what do we find out? Well, um, ideal is at least 50% sensitivity. So in this chart on the left, um, we're showing a, a logistic regression line uh, on a test set and the different um, points at which we tested people's response to uh, app sensitivity. Um, and what we can see is once you hit sort of 50% sensitivity, um, we are, our error bars are staying above 50% adoption. Um, and of course, as you know, sensitivity gets better, especially in that kind of, you know, when it becomes almost perfect at 97 or 99% uh, detection, then adoption will go up um, even further. As you go below 50% uh, proportion who report being willing to install decreases. And of course, reported willingness to install um, is an actual installation, right? Um, and so in a number of, of prior work studies uh, that I and, and my colleagues have done, you know, we find that these kind of surveys tend to um, be directionally correct. 
Um, so if we're seeing an increase like we see here, we will see that in the real world, but they're not necessarily like precise numeric estimates of what's going to happen. They tend to be overestimates, right? So you can kind of imagine all of these data points shifting down a little bit, um, which is why especially getting to that 50% sensitivity threshold or above is important um, for trying to get majority adoption. Um, I want to briefly comment also on the prediction accuracy. Um, so predicting sort of human behavior or human response, we tend to get much lower accuracy um, than we do when predicting other kinds of things like we traditionally see in machine learning. Um, so these kind of accuracies are actually what you would see um, when I've done commercial work and we want to predict how likely is someone to click on this ad or how likely is someone to click on this spam. Um, so these are kind of in the range of, you know, what decent models of human behavior look like, even though uh, if we were modeling uh, computational data or other machine learning kind of non-human data, they would not be super exciting. Um, I'll turn your attention to the, the chart on the right. Um, and this is our chart of uh, false positive notifications. Um, and here we see we start dropping below kind of that majority 50% line um, as we have more than 10% false positives. And if you remember, um, this scenario was with an app that had perfect sensitivity, and that's incredibly unlikely, right? So we're probably going to end up with 50% or better sensitivity and some amount of false positives. So it's really important for us to try to keep that under 10%. Um, and part of what's driving sort of a tighter range for false positives, of course, is that um, when we ask people in open answer questions, they said, oh, well, I can't go to work. I might not earn money. I can't see my family, et cetera. The consequences um, to them kind of directly from false positives in some ways are higher than they are from false negatives where the consequences are more to others. Um, the final thing I wanted to point out um, was in some other studies that we did, uh, we found that when you don't tell people anything about the accuracy of the app, their default is to assume that it's 50% sensitive. So if you're able to evaluate that, a, that your app is better than that, it really behooves you to tell people. Um, but if you don't know the accuracy of the app, people are kind of getting a center on that 50% assumption. Uh, and if the app is worse, then you know, we could discuss the ethics of this, but from a marketing perspective, you'd probably just not want to say anything at all. Okay. Um, so finally, touching on privacy expectations. Um, privacy expectations improve uh, the prediction accuracy that we have. So those logistic regression models I showed you, our accuracy of those goes up when we know people's like a priori privacy risk expectations. Um, and what that means, right, is that uh, people's willingness to install is dependent both on privacy and accuracy, which we kind of knew from the prior experience that I showed you. Um, but it's nice to confirm it in this sort of quantified place. Um, and when we ask people for these uh, privacy risk expectations, um, we see that uh, on average, people expect there's like a 0.01 to 0.001% uh, percent chance that information from a COVID app uh, will be compromised. And that's about the risk in the US of like petty theft. So you leave something unattended and it gets picked up. Um, so that's their expectation as sort of context. Um, people tend to expect that their bank accounts will be compromised more often. Uh, so this distribution would be shifted to the right if we asked them how likely they thought it was that someone would hack into their bank account. Um, so they do expect that COVID apps are a little bit more secure or privacy protecting uh, than potentially other online accounts. Uh, finally, um, I said earlier on that we had wanted to see, you know, how does adoption rate differ if we just let people kind of rely on their implicit privacy assumptions versus when we quantify and make explicit or confirm those assumptions up front. Uh, and we find no statistically significant difference um, between those two uh, things, which means that people really do have kind of a concrete privacy expectation in their head and they're treating it um, as if it was reality. Okay, um, so the final step is how do we use this kind of stuff to actually help us improve adoption in the real world? It's nice we know, you know, what are people thinking about? It's nice that we know that we can um, semi well predict, you know, people's intent to adopt based on quantified um, amounts of accuracy and privacy and that we sort of know where the line is on how good is good enough. Um, we can use some of our experiments to tell us like, ooh, uh, people prefer this benefit to that one, but how do we actually like, use this um, to drive adoption. Well, one question you might ask, right, is you might say, wait, 
I don't think we need to do all of this. Why don't we just pay people? Why don't we just incentivize them to adopt, right? And this is often how we get people to do things. We say, eh, I'm not gonna worry about convincing you. I'm just gonna pay you and I'm gonna make you do it because you want the money. So before I get to how we might use these findings, let's actually test out this idea. Um, so we use those conjoint analyses uh, where people make choices between pairs of apps. Um, again, to look at this question. And what we find is that offering people incentives, uh, which can take the form of uh, gift cards or can take the form of healthcare incentives. So you might say, I'll pay your insurance premium for the month if you install this app, or I'll give you three free doctor's appointments if you install this app, et cetera. Those kind of incentives change what apps people will adopt, but not how many people overall will adopt. Um, so in all of our experiments, we see sort of a consistent 20% uh, of people who are like, nope, I'm not adopting. You can't convince me to adopt. It's not happening. That same 20% does not matter if you incentivize them. For the other 80%, um, incentivizing them kind of changes their decision function. Uh, so if the, the, the chart on the left shows um, people's decision functions with intrinsic benefits, so things like this app will tell you you've been exposed, this app will protect people you love, et cetera. If we compare that to healthcare benefits, we'll pay your insurance premium, we'll give you doctor's appointments. We see that benefits become significantly more expensive. They go up by about 12%. And mobile data considerations um, become significantly less important. Um, and part of this we think is that mobile data, right? You pay for it every month. And so when I incentivize you, I'm sort of giving a commensurable quantity that you're able to like balance off. Oh, they're paying me. My mobile data only costs $30. So I guess if it uses that, that's fine. Um, when we look at giving people gift cards, so here you can have a five to $20 uh, gift card to a retailer of your choice. We see an even slightly higher uptick in the importance of benefits. Um, and we see, again, that the mobile data importance decreases. I can kind of compensate you for that. But something that's sort of interesting in this explicit monetary case is that we have a tiny uptick in the importance of battery life. Um, and while this is not a huge um, effect size, uh, this does align with some uh, findings in economics where once you start offering monetary incentives, sometimes those non-commensurable uh, quantities become even more important. You can't really pay me for battery life. So now I'm kind of more wary or more suspicious or care a little bit more about that thing that you cannot compensate me for. Okay, so in general, incentives change, you know, these decision functions, but importantly, they actually don't affect the top two uh, important factors, right? There's not a significant difference um, in the importance of, of privacy or accuracy in these incentive cases, and it doesn't make a dent in uh, how many people are willing to adopt. Okay, so we do actually have to um, try to encourage people to adopt and we wanna try to use our findings to do that. Um, this is what we're currently in the process of. Uh, so our results are being used directly in the marketing of COVID-19 apps in Israel um, and in other jurisdictions. And we're uh, currently in the process of working with the state of Louisiana in the US um, to do a number of advertising field studies where we take um, the benefits that were most effective in our surveys, where we test whether making statements about privacy is or is not helpful, whether making statements about uh, what data, data is collected is or is not helpful. Um, we're using kind of a number of uh, specifically tailored advertising field studies to try to experiment with and measure um, how we can improve COVID-19 app adoption. Uh, the secondary goal of this work is to sort of validate um, all of the self-report data that I've presented to you today, um, because we wanna make sure that we're able to, as we start to release these results, give people insight into, okay, the correction factor for people's intent to install again in the US is X. So when you, know, when you do this kind of chart and you say, okay, at 50% sensitivity, you know, somewhere between 55 and 75% of people will adopt, do I need to correct that down? Uh, and if so, by how much? And so we're able to do some um, direct comparison in the field, uh, which will help us for kind of doing science in the future, as well as to directly improve app adoption right now. Um, so in sum, 
Um, you know, so the, the goal of a lot of this work is not only how do we get people to adopt, but how do we do it ethically and responsibly? And how do we use people's data ethically and responsibly and respect um, what they want? And so what we find is, you know, while a lot of the talk um, in sort of the technology companies and et cetera is about, oh, privacy, et cetera, um, responsible data use goes beyond privacy. Um, to provide technology that respects people's preferences. So if they really want apps that have a particular level of sensitivity or have a particular set of benefits or have um, a particular level of control over their data, which maybe sort of falls into privacy, but is a little bit different, um, you know, part of responsibly encouraging adoption and responsibly building these apps is providing technology that respects those preferences. Um, and so uh, much of the work that's been done by the academic community trying to create um, privacy preserving apps has been exactly in line with that, right? For once we were able to sort of get out ahead of the technology companies and sort of build that in um, at the beginning. And now we're hoping um, in working with public health agencies and et cetera, to make sure that the way these apps are, are advertised and as people start to build in um, new features like Apple built in a data donation feature and et cetera, that these features are aligned with people's preferences. They're gonna help public health and they respect what people want and how they want their data to be used and how they want their time to be used in using these applications. Uh, thank you and happy to uh, take questions or start the discussion now. Thank you very much, Eliza. <laughs> um, I only wish we had known all of that when we started marketing the Swiss COVID app. <laughs> you know, we were a bunch of academics and we set out saying, you know, we've spent two months working on this very privacy preserving app. It's great. Everybody's going to want it because it's privacy preserving. And that got us up to about 20% in Switzerland. <laughs> So that yeah. was the market share for privacy. I think, um, yeah, it's it's good to it's good to look at it because I think that um, all of us pretty much probably come at this from a non-commercial, non-marketing perspective, and we don't really sort of understand, um, you know, people's preferences may be very different from what we perceive them to be, and they're the ones who make the final decision. So um, let me open the floor to questions. Please use the raise hand feature. Uh, I see some comments in the sidebar. Uh, so maybe it'd be easier if uh, we just did them as uh, verbal questions to Eliza. So just uh, raise your hand if you want to ask questions. Well, I can read some of the questions <laughs> if people don't want to repeat them themselves. Um, I think I asked most of them and I haven't found I the right hand feature. Uh, okay, go ahead. Then I was going to call on you. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, you know, my concern, you know, as I've put in is um, a typical uh, contact as traced in South Korea or in Taiwan only has about a 1% chance of infection. And there's this huge gap. And clearly, people, once they find out about the false positives, even with respect to exposures, let alone with, infect to, with respect to infections, that once they understand that, that very rapidly becomes their biggest concern. Um, I've been, uh, I've got no other word except shocked by some of the apps that have rolled out um, and what days they um, issue exposure notifications for, which include days where there's really no risk of exposure at all. They're very focused on the distance and time and they've issued notifications for days where there's really no risk of infection whatsoever. Um, and, you know, so in that case, we're talking about significantly less than a 1% chance of infection when you go and do that. Um, and so I guess uh, my concern is, is, you know, if the public knew, would they do that? And secondly, what should we be messaging the public? Like if we give them different positive notification screens, I mean, my own sense is that asking them to quarantine for up to 14 days, you know, they're never going to adopt if that is the consequence. And, uh, you know, trialing alternative messages that would still have epidemiological use and sort of, you know, this gulf. And I was on the phone to somebody from Apple the other day who literally didn't know that the consequence of sending this out was 14 day quarantine. That person at Apple thought that the only consequence was somebody would get tested and it was fine because they thought you could test out of quarantine. Uh, and, 
Yeah. So I, I, I you know, I, to me, you know, I learned a lot, but I, I, I still believe that the, the biggest issue here is, is false, is, is the fact that very few exposure notifications cause infection and that would lead to total collapse and will lead to total collapse. So can you comment and what are you doing and on forward on that? Sorry, I'll shut up now. No, that's a, it's a terrific um, question. I think you're touching on sort of a number of things, right? Which is like uh, originally, I think in some of the conversations with, with Google and Apple, right? It was like, oh, we're not responsible for the accuracy of these things. So there's sort of first the level of like, uh, do we even know how accuracy, how accurate the exposure notifications are? And then of course, you know, how likely is the exposure to lead um, to infection? I think this is a great point. Um, and even when we ask people, right, like, what do you intend to do after you get a notification if they're in a country where they're not forced to do something? Um, at least 30% of them are like, and yeah, now I would social distance maybe or wear a mask or something. You know, they're like, oh, well, you know, I'll try to be a little extra careful. Um, and sort of to, to your point, right, about what if we gave different levels of, of exposure notifications, um, this is like a common problem in, in security, right? Where we try to say, okay, uh, you know, someone might've gotten into your account. And a lot of times from, you know, the corporate side, we aren't actually sure whether someone got in. We got a bunch of signals that make it likely that someone got in. Um, and once people get these over and over again, but no one had gotten into the account, they quickly go to just ignoring them. Um, and so I think that's absolutely a problem here where A, they're already, a large portion of the population is inclined to ignore it to begin with. And then if they keep getting kind of false positive, even if it's not a false positive exposure, but false positive infection, they're extra likely to ignore. You know, I think this is sort of, um, I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. It's something we're still kind of trying to, to probe into. And it depends a lot on the, the culture or community that you're doing this app work in, right? So if it's a community where um, people really care about protecting others, you may be able to kind of push on that and make it less about like your direct infection. But if it's a really individualistic community, it's going to be kind of a tough thing. And there's a really big stick, right, that comes from getting this notification. So the easiest thing to do is to go, eh, I can't see you, um, which we know is happening even with manual contact tracing. So I don't have a great answer, but it's a very, very poignant question. Good. Uh, there's a question from Manfred. Hi, Melissa. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. So I'm based in Berlin. And in Berlin, we had a lot of, uh, or in Germany in general, we had a lot of problems with the Corona app. On the one side, privacy, you mentioned that. But on, on the other side, a very practical problem. A lot of the Corona tests didn't make it on time. So we had delays from up to one to two weeks because uh, that tracing wasn't, well, it's digitized, but it didn't work very well, to be honest. Uh, did you did you research the the uh, effect of, of this uh, uh, of this not being able to test people in time onto uh, your uh, your setting? The reason why I'm asking is the following: a lot of people didn't uh, who had installed the the application, of course, were discouraged uh, by this uh, really large time lag in the testing because they said, okay, why do I need the tracing app if I don't get my Corona test in time? It's all over until I know. Yep, yep. So um, I would say in the US, we aren't even quite there yet. Um, so part of what we're starting to look at now is even, even if people get the test, are they able to actually input that into the app and will they, right? Because there's a number of stages of dropout, which is like, are people going to adopt the app? Are they going to listen to the exposure notification? And then if they get a test and they get it in time and it's accurate, are they and are they able to put it into the app? Um, so we're starting to look at some of these sort of we would call later stages after adoption, um, but we haven't looked specifically at the problem of people getting it too late. Um, I do think this kind of connects in some ways to Joanna's question, right? Which is sort of like, as people, we've been really focused on how to get people to adopt these apps, but as people use them, they then realize extra flaws, right? I don't get the test in time. I don't actually get infected, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if, if I, again, take analogies to other parts of tech, usually what we see is like this steep drop off as people kind of go at. Now, sometimes 
you get some benefit from adoption where it's a lot of effort to uninstall the app. Um, not necessarily a lot, but it's some effort. So sometimes people just sort of leave it there, but they may not be likely to like add their test results again. So I think a big problem we're sort of seeing is like, should it even be the end user who's the one who's entering these test results? But we have a lot of privacy you know, issues if we wanted someone else to enter them. And so that's, you know, that's a bottleneck and we have not, we don't have any solutions to that one yet either, but we are starting to look at it. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, one, one of the additional problems that we experienced here was uh, that not enough people had installed the, the, app, the app. So I think off the top of my head, it's still below 20% in Germany. I had a very interesting talk uh, 10 days ago by one of the mathematicians, the simulation experts here in Berlin who run the simulations. Uh, by the way, a combination between uh, agent-based and uh, differential equations. So really, it's really cool what they can do. And my direct question to this guy was, um, um, does the corona uh, data help you? They have access to all this information when they run the, the simulations and, and they said not at all because it's not too, uh, not enough people. What helps them actually is the anonymized uh, access data from mobile phone providers. That, uh, he said, uh, uh, increased the accuracy of the predictions uh, quite a bit. So uh, in your opinion now, with your background from the US, does it make sense? So I'm pro apps and I'm, I'm telling this to everyone, don't get me wrong, but in your opinion, uh, how long can we uh, can we uphold the motivation of people to actually install it? Because also these results will come out. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and you kind of touch on something that um, I wasn't able to cover during the talk, but that, um, you know, there there's often sort of trade-offs in terms of also what people want out of the app. So one of the benefits that we see that people would most like is to have sort of hotspot information. Where Where is a location near me that has had the most people who are infected recently, right? And for privacy protecting reasons, we haven't had location data in these apps, which sort of prevents you um, from having that hotspot information. And that's something that would really incentivize people. Like in all of our tests, that's like the number one thing they want. And so we have this sort of funny tension where they, you know, and this is where sometimes there's like the trouble with trying to infer things from end users, right? They really want hotspots and they also want privacy. And you're like, hmm, okay, how do I, how do I give you the cake that you exactly want to eat? Um, and so I think that what you're touching on is sort of a different kind of accuracy or efficacy in a way, right? Which is not like how accurate is it for me, but like how helpful is it for public health? Um, for that, I would sort of say two things. One, in the US, helpfulness to public health is probably one of the least important benefits. So my suspicion is that may not sway people too much. Um, but in other places where that is a big motivator for installing these apps, then I think you will see um, erosion depending on how well people are able to understand uh, sort of what you just explained, right? So if they hear okay, the apps aren't useful because other computing thingies are better. You know, you may not lose them too much, but if they're um, very effective uh, at communicating that, then you absolutely might see that. In the US, I think less so just because people are very focused on what does it do for me? What does it do for my loved ones? Or this sort of joining the fight sentiment. And so they want to participate kind of whether or not it does anything useful. So, um, are there other questions, people who, who didn't find the raise hand feature? You can wave your hand in real life. If not, I'll, I'll ask a question. So, um, you know, one of the senses I've gotten from conversations with people who haven't installed the app and are reluctant to install the app is that um, they say privacy um, as a reason for not installing the app. But of course, if you ask them, they have WhatsApp and Facebook and Twitter and everything else on their phone. So they really are not tremendously concerned with privacy. Um, but you know, my sense was that uh, privacy is a sort of socially acceptable way of saying, I don't wanna be notified by the app and put into quarantine. Um, is there any way to sort of separate these out and sort of get 
uh, uh, sort of a non-socially acceptable response like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a, a number of techniques uh, in survey methodology that they use a lot of times for like drug use or other kind of risky, unsocially acceptable behavior. Um, one of which is to use what's called a list experiment. So you give people a list of say possible reasons or possible things that they might do. Um, and then you ask them like how many of those are true for you and you can do this sort of statistical comparison to figure out basically what percentage of people are saying no i don't want to install it because i don't want the notification um we've thought a little bit about that i think it's actually like a great follow-up because of course even in you know computer-based surveys have less of the social acceptability than like a face-to-face -face conversation or interview but they still have some um, and so that's kind of the best way of eliciting that i uh, to your question i think too one of the things we've found when we do sort of these open answer anonymous surveys that comes up um, is also that privacy gets mixed in with authoritarianism. Um, so it's not so much like the privacy of my data, um, but oh, the government is getting involved in my business. And despite the fact that, you know, they're Google or Apple based apps, I think the way uh, that the conversation has sort of gone and, and the partnership with public health agencies while useful, um, also has created this sense of like government sponsorship. And that seems to have raised kind of a different set of concerns for a specific set of people who maybe don't otherwise have technology privacy um, worries necessarily. So I think, um, you know, there's both this, I don't wanna know, and it's because it's the government specifically. Good. Um, I think we have time for one last question. If there's someone out there who would like to Pose a question. There are a few on the on the chat that somebody might want to bring up. <laughs> no. Okay. Going. Going. Gone. Thank you very much, Eliza. Thank you. And I'll I'll turn the floor over to Peter, who will give us uh, the musical interlude uh, for this evening. Uh, thank you, Jim, and also thank you, Eliza. Um, let me briefly share this screen for the final thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, to provide a smooth transition to the remainder of your day and to make a pretty bad joke um, to follow up on the Corona discussions. Uh, for the final notes, I'll play a little bit of FIBA by Peggy Lee. Um, as a reminder, our next event will take place on November 3rd and we'll deal with ethics and, ethics and AI, how AI is reshaping our world. Uh, panelists will be Deborah Johnson, uh, Giulielmo Tamburini and Yi Zeng, and the moderator will be Viola Schiaffonati. Uh, so see you there. Thank you for joining, um, goodbye uh, and enjoy, Peggy Lee. Never know how much I love you Never know how much I care When you put your arms around me I get a fever that's so hard to bear You give me fever When you kiss me, fever When you hold me tight Fever In the morning a Fever all through the night Sun lights up the daytime, moon lights up the night. I light up when you call my name, and you know I'm gonna treat you right. You give me fever when you kiss me, fever when you hold me tight. Fever in the morning, a fever all through the night. Everybody's got the fever that is something you all know fever isn't such a new thing fever started long 